Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Shireen Ben Zayed. I'm head of innovation at Finastra, and we are welcoming you for this live meetup, which is one in a series that are part of our Hack to the Future Global FinTech Hackathon. Hack to the Future is a FinTech movement igniting a world of financial sustainability, inclusion, and empowerment. So building on the success of our previous hackathons to redefine finance for good and build an unbiased FinTech future, we continue to use our position in the market to inspire the FinTech space to be open by default for everyone. And this year, we aim to, to drive engagement beyond our global FinTech ecosystem with three main themes that are uh, open to all. The first theme is a sustainable and inclusive finance. The second theme is embedded finance and banking as a service. And the third theme is decentralized finance. And today we'll be talking about decentralized finance. Um, we'll be exploring the different DeFi protocols and discussing how to connect this with um, traditional finance world. And for that, I'm really excited to have with me today uh, Etienne. Um, hey. you can please introduce yourself. Hi, Shireen. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, thanks, thanks first of all, for, for having me. It's really exciting to see bridges being built between uh, DeFi and TradFi. So pretty excited to be here. Um, a quick intro on my end. So uh, my name is Etienne Royal. I'm the former CEO of DeFi Buzz, now advisor there. Uh, but before being like full time in crypto and DeFi, I've been working 10 years in traditional finance. First as a consultant, working on products, instructed finance, and syndicated lending. Um, after that, I created my own company, co-founded my own company, FinTech One, um, which uh, got acquired a few years ago. And after that, I uh, actually jumped on the opportunity and started working in DeFi. Cool. Thank you so much. We're really excited to have you. And uh, DeFi Pulse is definitely one of the key players that um, uh, anyone exploring the DeFi space should go and check. So um, as we are starting to talk about DeFi and giving uh, really the um, knowledge level uh, amongst our audience, it can be quite uh, different really from one to the other. Can you guide us through, um, yeah, first, what is DeFi and what are the main DeFi protocols? And yeah, maybe a, a global overview of what you see the DeFi space looking like today. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, what is DeFi? It's complicated. It's kind of wide. Um, I would say that it's like any financial application being built um, in a decentralized fashion on public blockchains. Um, so that, that would be the, the wider uh, scope, I would say. Um, and so with regard to the current state of things, um, I would say uh, if we take a step back a little bit uh, and we backtrack a little bit to the, to the first days of DeFi, uh, DeFi really became a thing two years ago also uh, during DeFi summer. Uh, it was like uh, summer 2020. And um, so we, we've seen like a couple of uh, big protocols popping out uh, during these days. Uh, including Uniswap, MakerDAO, Compound, uh, Synthetics, and Wiren, uh, to, to name a few. And uh, so these guys, these teams, they really created DeFi from scratch um, and, and creating new financial primitives on blockchains. So this was like a big bang in the world of crypto. And they started taking off during the summer 2020. And so there, there was like a lot of innovation at that time. And um, last year, I would say, We've seen a new wave of DeFi protocols, which a lot of people like to label as DeFi 2.0, which in my opinion was a bit less innovative in a sense, because they were uh, kind of building on top of DeFi 1.0 protocols. Um, so the teams that I, I, I talked about a bit earlier. And so they were like a little bit of innovation, obviously. I don't want to put all the projects in the same bucket, but it was marginal uh, on the side. Uh, there were like a couple of twists, uh, maybe a bit more risk on protocols with riskier assets being whitelisted in these protocols and so on. Um, but they did do uh, a ton of new things like um, new tokenomics. They added more utility to the tokens, uh, especially because they were, for most cases, uh, anonymous people. And so they didn't have to struggle with regulation. So they could actually try things, which is quite interesting because we do have like new insights now to uh, model tokenomics in a better way, which is pretty exciting. Um, and, and right now, uh, I would say that the space with the NFT, the NFT craze and so on, and the, 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 the rise of new layer two solutions, 
um, the, the decrease of gas cost overall on blockchains, uh, we're seeing like uh, so many new use cases, uh, so many new teams and people coming from Web2 uh, with fresh minds. And, and, you know, like these people, they made, they built Facebook, they built like the leading tech platforms of the world, and they are now working in DeFi. So that's pretty exciting. And, um, and so I'm expecting a lot of innovation again uh, in the coming months and years. Obviously, it's going to be really tied to regulation uh, because uh, right now we're kind of in a closed circle. Um, but once regulation will start to kick in, if it's well made, properly uh, formalized, um, it's going to be a big bang because we're going to really be able to reach 8 billion people in the world. And that's what we're working for. So it's pretty exciting. The future is bright. Yeah, that's really exciting. Um... Etienne, do you want to walk us through some of the key uh, protocols that you mentioned? Maybe some of the historical ones, like the first ones that um, mm -hmm. you saw in the space. Um, sure, sure. Uh, we can start with you... make it out if you want. Yeah, sure. Do you want me to share maybe the um, DeFi Pulse leaderboard so we can look? Yes, at... please go ahead. Oh. Um, so. Yeah, as we can see right now, um, so maybe we can take a, a step back uh, and if we're looking at the, the website right now, so we're looking at um, a number, a metric that is called total value locked. It's uh, invent a metric that has been invented a few years ago by DeFi Pulse, um, and it's today by far the most widely used metric in the space. Um, and so the idea of this metric is to take into account, to count the amount of money that is actually locked into smart contracts, into DeFi-related smart contracts or protocols. And so it gives you an idea of the traction of a protocol and the traction of the overall space. And so right now on Ethereum and a couple of other chains, there are approximately $83 billion worth of tokens uh, put to work in DeFi protocols. It's a bit bigger in reality because um, there are other chains that we do not cover yet, but it's a, a work in progress. Um, and so if we're scrolling down a little bit, uh, we're going to see the, the leaderboard itself with uh, all the, um, the protocols uh, that we're covering. And so the first one right now is Maker, MakerDAO. And so we can touch on this one to start. I think it's it's one of the first, like DeFi really became a thing with MakerDAO and Uniswap um, and Compound, uh, to name a few. And so MakerDAO is quite interesting. It's it's uh, it's kind of magic money in a sense because uh, they they created a set of smart contracts that allows any user in the world to put uh, one asset uh, and use it as collateral. Okay, so you you would take like ETH for instance, the Ethereum native token, and lock it into a smart contract. And this ETH has a monetary value, let's say uh, one thousand dollars. Okay, so you lock. $1,000 worth of ETH into MakerDAO. And what the, the smart contract will allow you to do, uh, will allow you to do is to actually mint DAI, which is another token, which is algorithmically pegged to $1, okay? And so you're gonna be able to kind of uh, take a loan from the, from the protocol, and the protocol is gonna mint a new token, DAI, and give it to you. And obviously uh, you can't, uh, mint more DAI than the monetary value of your collateral. Otherwise, the collateral is going to be slashed and the protocol is going to, is going to um, um, heal himself automatically by selling the collateral for a stable coin. So it's over, over collateralization um, uh, lending model uh, with a synthetic asset. And so basically you put it to work, you mint DAI and you can take that loan and do whatever you want with that DAI, which is a, a dollar in a way. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, we can talk also about Compound, uh, which uh, is the number five here, uh, also one of the first DeFi native protocols. Uh, so Compound Finance uh, is what we call a money market. And so uh, basically what it allows you to do as an end user is take one asset that you own in your wallet and, and, and put it to work and lend it to other people in a, in a completely automated um, automated way. Okay, so you put your uh, USDC, which uh, which is USD, you put it uh, into, you deposit it into Compound, and you are going to earn automatically from the first second uh, interest rates on top, which is pretty compelling. And so everything is done automatically by the protocol. You do not have to take care 
of the lenders, the borrowers, and so on. And obviously, if you can lend, you can also borrow. And so the other use case is to actually be on the other side of the market and borrow money by uh, borrowing the money that people deposit. Okay. And so same as Maker, it's leveraging, it's using a, a over collateralization model where you cannot borrow more than the amount that you deposited, but you can borrow a different asset, so you can play with the assets. Uh, we can talk about maybe Uniswap. That sounds okay, Sharon. Maybe yeah, I think so. it's, uh, yeah. it's a key building block of the space. It's mm -hmm. by far the most widely used protocol uh, and forked, copy pasted. And so Uniswap is, uh, especially Uniswap E2, is uh, what we call an automated market maker, um, an AMM um, in short. And so what we can do with Uniswap um, is like, uh, let's say that we, you know, when we are exchanging goods and paying for goods um, on uh, online, we're actually using a third party like PayPal, for instance, uh, to pay for something in exchange of, uh, of something for something else. And so with, uh, and so we have to trust PayPal to, to actually do the transaction on our behalf. And we have to trust them that we will receive the right amount of money in exchange of something else. With Uniswap, it's exactly the same use case in short, uh, but there is no need for any centralized party between you and I when we're trading. So it's a way for me to actually trade my uh, Ethereum token for DAI or for USDC or BTC even in a completely trustless uh, way without any centralized party involved, which is pretty compelling uh, as well. Um, so it's kind of a trading marketplace. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's a good intro. I mean, there are like so many protocols, so we could spend hours on that. Unless you have like yeah. another one you would like to spend time on. But, uh. No, I think that's uh, that was really interesting to cover these three uh, as um, really good examples of what um, could be done today in the DeFi um, the DeFi space. It's really interesting for people like just getting um, getting started maybe with DeFi to understand that this is. Like you can you can buy crypto, you can invest in crypto or, or in different coins, and this is sort of the layer that comes on top of that. These are our like sort of a more complex operations or financial products that you can go with through these um, what we call protocols, which are either marketplaces or uh, decentralized exchanges, etc. I think Etienne, what's also really interesting is the is the governance part of this. Given all of these protocols are are um, decentralized here, um, I don't know if you would like to touch base maybe yeah. a little bit on that, maybe on the MakerDAO uh, example, and just as a as a quick intro to what it really means to be decentralized. Yeah, I mean, uh, first, like being decentralized is. Uh, it, it's not like black and white, you know, um, it's a continuum. There is no true, I mean, some protocols are completely decentralized. They are immutable, nobody can upgrade them. It's pretty interesting, like Liquidity, for instance, uh, is, a, is an interesting, uh, it's something like Maker, but nobody can upgrade the smart contract. Uh, the, there is no real governance happening. It's just like here. And if you want to use the protocol, it's going to be here, as long as Ethereum is running, which is interesting as a use case itself. So there is no true governance but it's completely decentralized. And then there are like protocols that are more or less decentralized. Uh, they are leveraging tokens, governance tokens. And so uh, most of the protocols that we're seeing here, they all have their own governance token. So in the case of MakerDAO, it's MK MKR. Uh, in the case of Uniswap, it's the UNI token. And so basically what it grants you is, it grants you the ability to govern the protocol and to uh, you know, like use the remaining tokens to incentivize uh, certain use cases, uh, to fund um, other things like improvements for the protocols, uh, to fund education things. Uniswap is well known for actually funding a ton of things uh, on the education side of things. There are foundations and so on. So they're actually leveraging the power of tokens and decentralization to uh, make finance a better place, which is pretty compelling. Um, and so typically when you're using a protocol, um, uh, there is like something called yield farming or farming that um, uh, is made, that is another set of smart, smart contract and it will allow you to earn the governance token of the protocol. Okay, so when you use the protocol, you get tokens in exchange. 
it's like um, the miles that you get when you're uh, buying a, a flight, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in a specific company, but it's tokenized. And so that's pretty interesting because in the end, the protocol is owned by its users. And so the users make the rules and not just like a couple of people owning a company. So that's that's the true ethos of decentralization. That's why it's pretty interesting to work in the space because in the end, finance is owned by the people. The infrastructure itself is owned by the people, by us. Yeah, thank you. That's really exciting, actually. It's a, it's a quite change in the way in the way all of these um, protocols actually operate. So yeah, definitely interesting. Um, Etienne, we have so many things to cover and I do have so many questions for you. So I uh, suggest so that we move ahead. Uh, my next question is actually on um, DeFi Pulse itself. Can you share with us a little bit more about how it was created? What was your journey there? Mm -hmm. uh, what challenge was it solving for? And um, yeah, what's what's next? Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, so before being named DeFi Pulse, DeFi Pulse was a community-owned project called Concourse Open. Mm -hmm. And so it started during the ICO craze, uh, so five years ago now, uh, during the, uh, you know, the, the first big bull run uh, that we're all aware of in 2017. And so it was just like a couple of people led by Scott Lewis, the founder of Defibers, one of the founders. Um, and so what they, they were doing at that time, they were actually doing due diligence on ICOs. So they were already curating the market. So people were coming on the Discord channels and say, okay, there is this new ICO, should I invest? And so what they were doing is like, just like doing the due diligence, looking at the teams, the credentials, looking at the smart contracts and just like telling them, okay, no, this is a red flag. And at that time, uh, there were like so many <laughs> scams, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. they did a great job creating the space. And so that's really something that defines developers, you know, being like a gatekeeper. Uh, in the absence of regulators. Uh, and so the space needed them and they, they did a great job as um, a community first. And then they, they created DeFi Pulse um, in late 2019 when MakerDAO started to become a thing and DeFi started to find a product market fit. And so the, the, the whole purpose of DeFi Pulse was to create a, a leaderboard uh, that ranks protocols in a way that is not, uh, that you can't play with or gain. Uh, because at that time there were like many leaderboards ranking blockchains and it was based on like the number of users the number of transactions and so on but like you could just run a bot on a on a shitty blockchain sorry and and and, and just like game the system and show your blockchain and showcase a blockchain at the top spot you know whereas there was no true user and true true adoption so it was the first like leaderboard using tvl a novel concept mm -hmm. That was a game, uh, game wall, and so they created this dashboard in late 2019, if I recall, and it started to become like a big thing. Like everybody was looking at the leaderboard and the big chart that we've seen to actually assess the traction of the DeFi space. Everybody on Twitter was uh, taking pictures of the of the charts and, and saying, "Oh, we've reached one billion dollars locked uh, in DeFi," which was really tiny. Was still tiny. We're talking about a few hundred billion dollars, which is a drop in the ocean in finance, but. Uh, but yeah, so we were kind of told the story of DeFi in a way uh, through this leaderboard. And and today uh, we expanded, I mean, like these last years, we expanded and, and created new business line. We bootstrapped new protocols as well. Uh, but the one thing that we should talk about today maybe is the index business uh, mm -hmm. that we've started uh, a year and a half ago also. Um, it's called Scalara.xyz. And so what we're doing is we are, so, I mean, I believe that you guys know the, uh, the concept of indices in traditional finance, like the S&P 500 or the CAC 40 in France. And so the idea is to uh, just buy a share of an index and by buying the index, you get exposure to like uh, the biggest company in a specific sector or country. Okay. And, and the constituents, the equity that you own through that index is actually being rebalanced on a quarterly or monthly basis, depending on the index and the rules. And so it's kind of a sit and sit back and relax investment strategy in a sense. Um, and so what we're doing at DeFi Pulse and Scalara, the, the XYZ, uh, we're actually replicating that, uh, but applying that to uh, the decentralized finance space and more globally, the, the Web3 space. And so we, uh, we are actually designing indices 
um, and licensing these indices to protocols and DAOs that are now allowed to use our brand and our knowledge to implement these indices uh, on chain through smart contracts. Uh, we've got a couple of indices. I think we've got a couple of hundreds of million dollars locked uh, into the indices that we license uh, today. Um, and um, and yes, yeah, so we, we've got a couple of leading indices today. The DeFi Pulse Index is by far the most widely used and known DeFi uh, index. Uh, we've got flexible leverage indices. We've got even a, an NFT-based index that we launched a couple oh, cool. of weeks ago. That's pretty cool, yeah. So you, you can actually get exposure to the, to the, to the best-in-class NFT projects uh, by uh, buying a single token. And we're going to rebalance the index mm -hmm. on a monthly or quarterly basis uh, to get you exposure to the, to the whole uh, NFT market. So that's pretty interesting. And we've got tons of plans for new indices in subsectors of the DeFi space. And so, so today we... Uh... Oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, as you mentioned, you were licensing those indices. So you sort of uh, design the index and manage mm -hmm. rebalancing and everything. And then um, you have other um, players so, in the DeFi space that implement them. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're, we're not at any point in time, we're actually touching the user's funds. Uh, what okay. we're doing is we're, we're just like designing, we were actually leveraging our knowledge in the space because we are mm -hmm. working with all these projects we really know deeply the space we know how to uh, uh, really uh, you know like find out the cream of the cream and and, and find out the, the scams and the and the bad projects so uh, we just like select the, the the blue chips project and put them into our indices but what we're doing is just like designing the index we're kind of the brain uh, in a sense and 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 then we're licensing the ip to mm -hmm. other protocols and DAOs um, and corporations to actually uh, manage the rebalancing themselves following a methodology that we design. So we're just an information provider. Um, and, and these protocols, they're actually implementing their version of our methodology. No, oh, thank you. That's it. clear. Um, Etienne, what do you see next in the space here for indices? Like you mentioned NFTs, which are really interesting. How do you see the space evolve? Mm. Um, so one thing that is quite interesting in DeFi is uh, what we call composability. Um, mm -hmm. And so the idea of composability is that any, any financial strategy that you could implement, you know, like trade uh, asset X for asset Y or uh, lend asset uh, up until X, you know, like any trading strategy, you can actually tokenize it. So you can buy a token that is working automatically and seamlessly and transparently and doing the work for you on your behalf. And so what we're doing at DeFi Pulse is we're, we're actually in the process of creating indices composed of yield bearing assets. So the idea is to give people the ability to uh, get exposure to the whole like um, crypto ecosystem and the yields that are pretty compelling today, but with a, through a single token or a single land index that is being licensed to protocols and DAOs that will implement it. And so this is something we're working on. And I mean, like follow the DeFi person Twitter, you, you're going to see a ton of news on that subject in the coming weeks. Uh, we are also planning to create new uh, indices uh, in different subsectors, sub sub um, infrastructure, uh, entertainment, I mean, like everything that is taking off in, in Web3 okay. is going to be part of an index at some point. And we're the leading index provider, so we'll, we'll do it. Cool. We'll be watching for, uh, for all these new indices. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, another topic that I, I wanted to, to discuss with you, Etienne, is really how, how can we bring those, uh, all these innovations that we see in the DeFi space, how can we possibly bring them to the traditional finance space? Uh, it's a great question, and uh, to be honest, I'm like waiting for it. <laughs> I'm waiting uh, for it. I mean, we've seen the first. So what's that? That's what we usually call CDFI, uh, centralized mm -hmm. decentralized finance. So a centralized entity like a bank um, leveraging the DeFi infrastructure to provide services to their customers in a, in a seamless way with a Web two UX uh, like a neo bank, for instance. And so um, 
the first attempt or the first uh, the first uh, implementation of that type of service uh, is already live and obviously it's really like um, complicated not not from a technical standpoint but from a regulatory standpoint um, and so that's why it's taking time to actually be implemented but the first use case has been implemented already by conbase uh, and so if you're looking at the conbase website uh, you can actually buy uh, invest, uh, lend money through compound finance, but just by using uh, Coinbase, which is um, a new bank in a sense. And so yeah. that's pretty interesting. So the, it's just a UI, an interface through which you, you're going to invest in DeFi, but you don't have to, to deal with all the complexity of uh, Web3 and the wallets and so on. It's just like pretty easy to use. And so that's something that is going to be huge. Um, and, and we're starting the first use cases uh, today. There are also a Canadian company doing it, uh, which is called Wonderfy. Um, and so we're actually working with them on the index side of things so that they can yeah, uh, provide indices to their customers. Um, and so they're, they're, it's going to be an app. So think about it as a neobank, but instead of using a traditional ledger to keep track of the customer's accounts and balances, they will just do it on the blockchain which is super easy to do because it's already here. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's going to be the, the day regulation allows crypto bank and, and neo banks to become crypto, uh, to leverage the, the DeFi infrastructure, it's going to be a big bank because it's just a plug and play thing. Uh, the DeFi protocols are here. You just have to call an API and you, you use it. That's it. So pretty easy. It's just a front end to be built. And uh, what regulation constraints do you see there? Or do you see any any countries, regions moving really uh, with regards to the regulation there? So I, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert. So I, I don't really want to throw out any like bad ideas around that, but, um, but uh, or fake news. But um, I think the, the US, I mean, even though it is tricky, they are doing, like, they, are, they are moving forward, right? They, mm -hmm. they have like a, a culture of innovation. They want to bring things forward. And they've done that in the past with their Web2 companies uh, protecting them. And I believe that they're doing the same thing in the process of doing the same thing with their Web3 companies. And today, most of the innovation is taking place there already. So we should actually push the regulator in, in the EU and France to actually follow the same path to become a leader. Because we do have like uh, outstanding companies in, in France. I mean, we've got like uh, Ledger, for instance, which, which is one, one of the, the leading hardware wallet uh, providers. So we should protect them. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So hopefully we'll see um, the regulation moving in the space and uh, allowing for some of these innovations to happen and to be brought to the bank's clients. Um, mm. You mentioned Coinbase. Do you see uh, any traditional banks uh, already connecting to some DeFi protocols? No, not really. I mean, uh, uh, mostly new companies that crypto native mm -hmm. companies are doing it. Um, traditional bank didn't yet. What, what I've seen so uh, though is the, um, uh, the trading of cryptocurrencies, which is not really using DeFi. It's just like a trading marketplace, um, like any action, uh, any equity you could trade on any platform. So, um, but no, no DeFi integration to my knowledge. Oh, see, yes. One thing that is being worked on uh, that is pretty interesting as well, um, is, um, the Ave protocol. We didn't talk about them, but they are, mm -hmm. they've been doing a great job these uh, last years and it's a lending protocol like compound. And what they're doing is they are creating lending markets for banks. And so they are like gatekeeping, uh, gatekeeping, uh, lending market. So you have to be whitelisted to actually be able to lend and borrow money on these markets, which is okay because uh, you comply with the regulations, the QIC uh, process and so on in the, in the traditional world. And they are actually allowing a couple of banks um, to lend the money of their customers on these markets because they know who's going to borrow the money in the end. So it's, it's just like as seamless as in the traditional financial space which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, there, there is definitely innovation happening, but it's still really tiny. And uh, if we uh, were to put really all the regulation questions aside, um, mm -hmm. like for banks that would like to, to get started, um, I guess, yeah, first step is 
obviously giving their clients possibility to have maybe a crypto wallet to invest in some uh, cryptos. But uh, beyond that, what would be the next steps? I mean, um, I again, I think that from a technical standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, it would take a week for an engineer to actually plug um, any DeFi protocol to a bank account. You know, what, what's going to be more tricky is um, is like the custody of the funds, uh, because um, I believe that banks will want to custody the funds on behalf of their customers. And so they have to secure that. And, and, and so either they decide to actually uh, buy other hardware wallets and solutions from companies like Ledger and do it on their own to be like a sovereign and own the assets themselves, which requires obviously some investment because you have to secure that. And it's not, it's completely different from the traditional world. Um, and uh, otherwise you can actually leverage uh, solutions on the market like BitGo or even Ledger Enterprise Solutions to uh, let other people specialized uh, in this market to actually custody the funds of your customers on your behalf. And this way you just have to deal with the integration which is pretty straightforward. It's just a couple of lines of code. Um, so, I mean, like regulation is the tricky point. Otherwise it's easy. Cool, thank you. That's really exciting actually. And maybe um, we'll get to the hackathon later, but uh, <laughs> maybe a side note to the hackers, if you'd like to build something really quick for the hackathon. Maybe it's not that complicated to uh, to connect bank account information. You can find the data on, on the Finastra's Fusion Fabric Cloud platform and then plug it to some of the DeFi protocols. So that would be a good prototype to build and experiment uh, in this space. Um, the other, uh, the other question I had for you, Etienne, um, again, regarding bringing DeFi protocols and uh, all the DeFi innovations to the bank's client is more on the um, SME side. So we usually think a lot about consumers, so offering them the possibility to invest or, um, uh, yeah, uh, have some, uh, have access to the DeFi protocols. But what about um, SMEs, small businesses or, or large corporations? How how would that work? Uh, what benefit would they would they get, in your opinion, from DeFi, and and how can banks mm -hmm. possibly help there? Um, so I would say one of the, the currently the biggest use case uh, with regard to SMEs and corporations and crypto on the other side is maybe uh, well known because of MicroStrategy. Uh, you know the, comp the U.S. company that is actually buying a ton of Bitcoin to edge again. Uh, you know, against inflation, so that that's the first, the most widely used uh, use case um, of the of the space right now. Uh, but what what we're seeing that is trying to take off, but it's really tiny again. Um, still, it's uh, corporations using DeFi protocols to lend money, uh, to borrow money, and so for instance, you can look at a website called Maple.finance. Uh, which is a lending protocol like Compound or, um, or Aave, as I mentioned a bit earlier. But instead of being retail focused, uh, what they do is that they allow retail to put their money to work that is going to be lent out to corporations going through a KYC process and, you know, like a due diligence done by the DAO. So you own the token of the, pro of the protocol. You can do a due diligence and accept borrowers, customers. So it's a bank but decentralized lending money from any retail user uh, in the world. So that's pretty interesting. And it's actually used by a couple of corporations. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how much uh, outstanding loans they have, but I think it's uh, a couple of hundreds of millions already. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely a use case, but it's still small compared to retail. Um, we also had a couple of discussions in the past with uh, DeFactor, which is another player in the space and also a partner of our Hack to the Future Hackathon, uh, where they focus really on um, uh, allowing SMEs or helping them get access to finance uh, via DeFi. Mm -hmm. and um, somehow by turning their invoices or other real world assets into into nfts so just wanted to to get your thoughts as well on that and how do you see the space evolve yeah sure so um, 
it's again like we, we've said it a bit earlier uh, one of the issues that we're facing today in DeFi is that it's a closed circle so people tend to say that it's not real because it's just crypto and 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 one thing that is going to completely change the game uh, along with regulation is the ability to bring on-chain off-chain assets so like real estate for instance so if I could use real estate in MakerDAO, I could actually take a loan automatically, uh, taking my house as collateral um, and just like doing it for free uh, or almost for free, which is awesome. Um, and so, and I could do that with a house or with any type of collateral that or real world asset that has value. Um, the issue that, it, that, that comes with that is the fact that blockchains, they are a closed environment. And so they don't know the price of a, a, a flat, for instance. If I'm putting my flat on blockchain, on the blockchain, they don't, they don't, like, nobody knows how much it is worth, right? So how can I know how much I can borrow based on that? So I, I have to rely on a third party to actually provide uh, data to the smart contract and saying, okay, this flat of this like piece of real estate is worth uh, 100K, and therefore you are allowed to borrow up to 80K not more. And so that that requires a third party you need to rely on, which is going against the ethos or the whole purpose of the smart contracts and the blockchains. Um, and so bringing often assets on chain is insane uh, in terms of it is incredible, sorry, in terms of value add, uh, but it's really complicated because smart contracts are automated. So if the guy who's actually um, assessing the price of the real estate piece is actually messing up with uh, the price feed. Well, it could trigger a lot of events, uh, a lot of events on chain that is going to liquidate a position or something. And, and that's not something that you want to see. And so uh, it's tricky. And what I would like to see um, later down the road is instead of taking like uh, ledger off chain ledgers, like uh, you know, when you're buying a flat, there's uh, someone that holds um, the proof of ownership for you that is regulated. But instead of issuing this proof of ownership off chain, to into actually issue that natively on chain. And so, if I know by design that this flat has been bought by Etienne and it's stored on Ethereum, then I can use that proof of ownership natively on Ethereum without having to trust someone that is making the bridge between the off-chain world and the on-chain world. And so that is not happening. I mean, like, this is not existing. It doesn't exist today. But the day it will, it's going to be incredible for the space because we're going to just bring trillions of assets on-chain and the growth is going to be exponential. So yeah, that, that was yeah. my take on the subject. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I can definitely see how exciting that could be because uh, if we are uh, if we are issuing all of these like uh, documents or um, having these assets as uh, as blockchain native, um, it can also solve you know for the issue that you mentioned earlier about um, having having price information about your flat. Like if you have sufficient. Um, real estate contracts on chain already, maybe that's something that you can also, that can be handled automatically, sort of a getting a, a price based on the location and different factors mm -hmm. and the flat information, and then it it can possibly all be automated and on chain. Yeah. Um, but might be a bit <laughs> further. <laughs> um further in the line. And uh, Etienne, you mentioned this is really, I mean, uh, all of these innovations that are more towards SMEs or corporates and um, being a really a tiny bit. Do you see uh, Do you see any newcomers uh, or new joiners in the space that are focusing specifically on that, or is it still too early? Um, yes, I, I mean, like the, the two that I mentioned, uh, Maple Finance is quite. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. new, but it's. I mean, we. There are like maybe five projects working on that. Um, so it, it's not that much um, of a space yeah. yet. Um, so uh, I would say Ave today um, is the, the biggest project working with corporations and especially banks to create a more institutionalized DeFi ecosystem. 
Um, but I'm pretty sure that there are many more protocols and, and teams working on that, but uh, the space is too big to, to keep up with today. So <laughs> I don't know, maybe maybe to, tomorrow someone is going to create something incredible for that, but I don't know that. Cool. Looking forward to it. And yeah. um, next, I wanted to uh, to bring our discussion back to the hackathon. I wanted to, to get your thoughts. We've discussed lots of things in the DeFi space from... Uh, different protocols, indices, uh, connecting this with uh, traditional finance, how that would possibly work for SMEs or corporates. Um, what are the areas that where you'd like to see more innovations happen? Or mm -hmm. if you were to maybe give some tips to the hackathon participants as where, where they should focus on, what would be your advice yeah. there? Um... I would say that uh, one interesting thing about DeFi and blockchains is that the uh, layer one and layer two solutions um, are more and more uh, efficient from a gas uh, point of the, the, the gas cost that you have to spend when you are sending a transaction or computing some data is decreasing really fast, uh, making making blockchains way more uh, efficient uh, from a transaction point of view. And so all the protocols we've discussed today and all the existing protocols that you can use today in, in DeFi, they have been built specifically taking into account these like constraints of gas cost. Okay, so the AMM design of Uniswap takes into account the gas cost and, and they simplified a ton of things because they don't want users to pay hundreds of dollars every time they click on buy or sell. Uh, and so within the design of these protocols are taking into account lots of constraints because of like this, like, uh, um, um, I would say, uh, lack on the technical side of things uh, on these blockchains. Now that we're, we are in the process or we already solved these limitations, uh, the sky is the limit. Uh, all the new people joining Web2, uh, from Web2 to Web3, they can come up with fresh ideas, come with fresh ideas, do not necessarily try to replicate what has been done in the past, just like look at finance, the traditional finance world, look at Web2 and try to come up with a fresh ID. You can develop it now on Web3 because there are no more limitations in terms of gas cost. So the product design uh, constraints are lifted now. Um, so no advice is like keep an open mind, um, uh, come with a fresh ID and, and try. Um, yeah, that, that would be your advice, but don't try to replicate what exists already. Yeah, thank you. It's really interesting, actually, to take that um, perspective and how how historically some of the products were designed based on the constraints they had at the time. So, yeah, <laughs> that's a very good advice. Don't replicate, think fresh and new what, what could be done today. Um, I suggest that we move now to some of the questions that we've got from the audience. And uh, anyone watching us live, uh, please continue posting your questions on YouTube or on LinkedIn, depending on where you're watching us. So um, let's take the first question from um, Shant uh, asking about how safe is it to invest today in, in, uh, in crypto, mentioning some of the stolen, money uh, that we see now and then happening. So any, any things, any, any thoughts on that, Etienne? Yeah, that, that's bad news, <laughs> definitely. Um, I would say that, um, um, that there are a lot of acts, it's true, but if you're taking a lot of risk, obviously uh, you're gonna get a lot of rewards, but the likelihood that you will get uh, your funds stolen is increasing. And that's what I was talking about a bit earlier with these like new DeFi protocols. Uh, they didn't really follow the, the first wave of DeFi 1.0 protocols. They rushed things, they accepted new types of collaterals, they, they played with like cross chains, things that are way more complicated. And, and so they didn't really follow the, the, the guidelines or the, the, the best practice of the first wave of builders. And so that's why it led us to a situation where yeah, there are so many acts and so many people losing money. Uh, but if you are actually following the guidelines, um, reading a lot about DeFi, um, you know, like be knowledgeable and, and, and understand how it works and just like do not take too much risk. Um, in that case, you can actually mitigate the risk. But obviously there is no zero risk. I mean, even compound, 
uh, got hacked once. So um, be careful with your funds. Do not put everything in the same basket, obviously. And you see, I'm not providing any financial advice because I'm not an expert in finance, obviously. But um, but yeah, I mean that that's a risk. Um, the thing that is cool about DeFi is that uh, the longer a protocol is uh, used and, and isn't act, the safer it is because like the likelihood that it's going to get act is uh, lower and lower. And so all these protocols we talked about, Aave, Compound, and so on, they are pretty safe today. I mean, they, they manage billions of dollars for years, um, and so nobody act them. So, I mean, it's pretty safe in the space of DeFi. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a risk, definitely. It's, it's, it's tech in the end. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, next question we've got is from uh, Tina asking us, um, uh, with uh, DeFi protocols, there will be no centralized authority that needs to check customers' credit score and verify their real identity. Will this be a, or is it already a threat to the credit unions or banks? Um, I don't, I mean, it's a tech. Again, some, some answers. So it's not really a threat in the sense that if banks adopt the tech, they will thrive. If you think about Coinbase, they are becoming a bank. Okay, it's a neo bank and crypto bank. And so it's a bank. They are providing financial services to their customers. They're just using a different tech under the hood. And so, and they are like valued $40 billion. So, I mean, it, it, it's a successful bank in the end. So I don't think it's a threat. I mean, it's it's a threat if you don't embrace it, like any new tech or innovation. Mm -hmm. If you do embrace it, then you're gonna thrive. Cool, that's a great answer. Uh, we've got another question from Tina, so let's continue with that. Um, and this one is more about, um, yeah, uh, is it possible to use crypto as collateral for mortgage? Or would that be possible in the future? uh so you mean like uh putting using crypto and borrowing money like money like euro and dollars in the real world uh yeah. it's possible yeah there are like a few services that do that i think coinbase is going to release one soon mm -hmm. uh so they you will be able to use btc bitcoin and borrow some money um and and just withdraw it to your bank account so going from the crypto world to the fiat world um there are other services doing that as well um also i think that it's there's a lot relate i mean a, it's available technically speaking but it's really tied to your uh, local regulation and tax uh related services and and, and rules so uh look at that first because maybe you're going to be taxed on that um and so be careful with that but yeah that that's i mean like it's possible definitely Sort of cool, thank you. And, uh, yeah, 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 and definitely something also interesting for banks to look at as a mm. as a as an additional service, an interesting service to to offer their clients. Um, I think that's mostly it from um, the questions perspective. We've got another another question actually from Shailendra. Um, that is more about, uh, I think this question came when we were looking at, um, when we were discussing uh, different ideas that the hackers can work on. Uh, so the question was, what about digital contracts and NFTs? Any any thoughts on? Um, I mean, uh, the sky is the limit again. Um, NFTs are well known because of the, uh, you know, like the, the, the NFT craze and the art and the, the crypto punks and the apes and so on. Uh, but uh, NFTs and DeFi is definitely, you can mix them up. There are lots of protocols. I mean, lots. there are a couple of protocols these days actually mixing NFT and DeFi, NFT Fi. It's a new sub trend. Uh, and so you can mm -hmm. put assets to work within an NFT smart contract. So your NFT can actually be a yield bearing NFT. You can use your NFT as collateral because it has value. Um, uh, and so you could actually take a loan using your NFT as collateral. Uh, there are also a couple of projects that I know about that are using, uh, planning to launch options on NFTs or insurances. So let's say that you buy an NFT on OpenSea or whatever the market, uh, whatever the marketplace, mm -hmm. and um, and and you're a bit scared about the price, so you can actually buy an insurance on the price uh, and say, okay, for like a month, I don't want to. I mean, like I, I want to be able to sell back 
the asset at the same price, even if the price decreases. Uh, you know, like you can do pretty much anything you want because it, in the oh, end, it's that's an really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And um, you mentioned using NFTs as collateral for loans. How would that work, really, if um, from a valuation standpoint? Like, uh, how do you uh, know the the value of the NFT to be able to to use it as collateral? Uh, it's a tricky part, uh, definitely. Um, that that's why there are not that many protocols working on that yet. Mm -hmm. um, but what they do usually is they. Uh, I mean, the current state of things, they do simple things. They are using the floor price of a collection. So the minimum price that is currently proposed on that collection, and they use it as a way to value the NFT, even if the, the NFT that you use as, uh, is a bit more rare, you know, in the collection, because depending on the rarity of your uh, piece of NFT, maybe the price is, uh, is, is greater and so on. But yeah, and there are also, uh, also um, other innovation that we don't talk about that, but one really interesting protocol that we use uh, at DeFiPers is called uh, NFTX. And so with NFTX, what you can do is uh, you can actually fractionalize an NFT into tokens. So oh, cool. for instance, if you can't afford to buy a CryptoPunk, but you want to be part of the revolution and buy a CryptoPunk, well, you can actually buy a piece of a CryptoPunk represented by an ERC20 token that is a, a fungible token like uh, Ethereum, for instance, like ETH. And so that allows you to buy a small part of it. And, and that's actually what we're using uh, under the hood with the uh, NFT uh, I index that we've created at DeFi Boss. Cool. Thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, I think we've got lots of ideas here for everyone uh, that would like to take part in, in in the hackathon. Definitely lots of things to um, to explore and uh, possibly to work on to build something for the hackathon. I just wanted to share again the the link. So for everyone interested in, in joining Hack to the Future, it's on fintech.devpost.com. You've got till the 10th of April to, to join the hackathon. Uh, Etienne is one of our judges on the DeFi category, so um, maybe you'd be amongst the, the finalists and you'll get to um, get his feedback as well and advice on how to take your project uh, forward. Um, with that, Etienne, I wanted to thank you so much for this uh, conversation Thanks, that I really enjoyed. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And, uh, uh, and yeah, to the people joining the Ecathon, if, if you have a question, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn yeah. or uh, through sharing that would be happy to help during the, the addition process. Absolutely. That Thanks sounds amazing. That. <laughs> Thank you. So anyone, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Feel free to reach out to Etienne or myself. We'd be happy to, to connect and continue the conversation. Um, make sure to visit fintech.devpost.com for any uh, more information for registration for the hackathon. Thank you so much again, Etienne, and thank, thank you everyone for watching us. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.